Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. One Million by One Million, as you know, is the first and only global virtual incubator accelerator in the world with the mission of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars beyond in annual, G, uh, annual revenue, build a trillion dollars in global GDP, and 10 million jobs. This is our 247th public free roundtable, and we've done almost the same number of roundtables in our premium program as private roundtables, maybe a little bit uh, fewer, but, uh, but we do a lot of roundtable mentoring. So, uh, you know, anything that you do that much, you get a little bit good at, you know. So, um, it's a, you know, it's a popular place where over 25,000 people have uh, come to participate and honored us. Many of you have honored us with your, with sharing your um, journeys, your uh, issues, your strategic questions and so forth, and we have tried to be as helpful as possible in a short period of time, we get, uh, you know, uh, 15 minutes of mentoring with each person. Um, this event is being recorded. You will have the recording available in our, on our blog as well as on our uh, YouTube channel. If you're live tweeting the show, please use hashtag 1M1M. Our Twitter handle is at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. So uh, we, we push a lot of really great content very inspiring, very educational content through the Twitter channel. So if you're looking to follow a good, solid content, rich content channel, this is a very good one. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, which has recordings of every single session to this day. And uh, again, very rich content um, worth listening to. Um, these are the call-in instructions. We're not quite ready for call-in yet. So I will let you know when we're ready for call-in and I'll put this slide back up again. But uh, I, I hope we will have time for call-ins, usually we do, but that would be towards the end of the session. So today's uh, round table is part of our ongoing celebration of the Billion Dollar Unicorns book release. This is the first volume of the Entrepreneur Journey series um, that we have been publishing since 2008. And, um, you know, it's a, the format is really, uh, I've tried to simulate for you the experience of actually sitting down with an entrepreneur who has built a significantly successful company and having a coffee, asking all kinds of questions that you would like to ask if you were in that situation. So the stated goal of the Entrepreneur Journey series is to crystallize and, um, you know, capture institutionalize the tribal knowledge that floats in the heads of successful entrepreneurs and package that up so that a very large number of entrepreneurs around the world can access them easily. So we've had you know, over 600 uh, stories like this, this that we have captured and uh, you know, the entrepreneurs who have participated in the series have been very generous and very forthcoming with their um, you know, experiences, sharing their experiences. And this book, The Billion Dollar Unicorn Book, has 17 such stories, and uh, you will be amazed at the level of candor as well as the level of insight that we've been able to pack into this little volume. And in celebration of that, we have invited today Chris Gladwin, who is uh, the founder and vice chairman of Cleversafe, a very interesting company um, that is being built in Chicago in the enterprise storage space. And uh, Chris is, is a fellow MIT grad. That's something that always warms my heart. And uh, also, CleverSafe, the reason we have identified CleverSafe to be featured in this series is it's a company that we believe is going to become a unicorn company. Um, so we're going to talk to Chris and uh, learn whatever we can learn in a half hour from his experience, his journey, and you will also find his entrepreneur journey story on the blog. So uh, Chris, welcome. It was a pleasure talking to you while we did the entrepreneur journey series, and I thought it would be valuable for our audience to listen to you and, and uh, learn more in this session. Hi, Sharmana. It's uh, nice to see you and talk with you uh, 
somewhat in person. And uh, looking forward to our conversation. So, Chris, what? Um, tell us a bit about uh, CleverSafe. Uh, set us some context about what you've done to build this highly valuable company, and um, how are you planning to become this? You know, now popularly termed unicorn, but getting to a billion dollar valuation market cap company. So simply put, um, what CleverSafe does is we make the largest data storage systems in the world. And according to IDC, we just moved into the uh, number one position among object storage vendors. We just passed EMC. And so we now, um, not only do we make the largest systems, but we're the largest provider of these kinds of large systems. And, you know, in terms of kind of getting to billion dollar value, you know, with that kind of a, a mission, um, basically, if you pull it off, um, it's it's very you know you, you need to be billion dollar value. The market for very large scale what what IDC calls capacity optimized storage systems is a twenty billion dollar market that's growing you know five to ten percent a year. And so you know if you want to be a leader in that market, you better plan on being a multi billion dollar company. Now, uh, remind me when you started uh, CleverSafe. I started it just over 10 years ago in November of 2004. And what, uh, this is something that is always interesting, you know, because we work with so many early stage entrepreneurs. What did you see in the market in 2004 that signaled to you that this is the market to go after? Because a lot, well, you're absolutely right. The choice of which market to go after almost is the primary determining factor whether of whether you will build a unicorn or not. Oh, for sure. Um, you know that. You know, if you talk to any VC, and I know you've talked to a bunch. You know, what they'll say is what they're really betting on is the market and the people. And their idea is if you have a big enough market that has the right kind of dynamics to support uh, a new entrant, and you have a great team, uh, that. Those are the most important ingredients. Most likely what will happen is your product or, you know, what you exactly do will change during that time. Um, and so it's really all about the market and the people. Um, so that, that's really what we, you know, that, that's kind of having started a few companies like this before, I, I have the same process, which is, um, you know, first and foremost, you, you look at a market and you say, you know, how big is the market? You know, why now? Does it need to have um, a new entrant? You know, what's the opportunity for a new leader? And, you know, what you look for is disruptive change. And, and what, we, what we saw in, in, in enterprise storage was just this crazy growth. Um, you know, back in 2004, the number of companies that were deploying at petabyte scale, meaning um, uh, a quadrillion bytes of data every year, was really pretty small. It was in the, you know, the tens, and they were all custom-built systems, and they were, you know, companies like Google and Microsoft and some government things. And, you know, what, what I foresaw, which really wasn't that insightful, was that data was going to grow. It was going to grow a lot. And so the, these massive storage systems, which at that time, you know, required, you know, $100 million of custom-built, you know, tons of expertise, was going to become a, a product category that, you know, the Fortune 100 and lots of organizations were going to want, and there needed to be a solution. And if you looked at the products that existed on the market, they they just were not capable, you know, at a design architectural level of, of getting to that kind of scale. And so that, to me, was a perfect opportunity. You have this exploding market, so you, you have this accelerating demand, and there was no existing supplier that had the capability in their current products to address it. And uh, that actually brings us to the um, innovator's dilemma, the, the, the exactly. competitors in the market that you were faced with, yeah. MC and HP and, and all these very large companies, they all, all had big, thriving businesses in the storage space, and they were not going to disrupt that, uh, that kind of a situation to, uh, to bring in a new, new product. That, that was yeah. your observation. Yeah, and, it's, it's, you know, I've read that book. Uh, and the whole series, and you know, you read it, and it's you know, it's a great book, it's very insightful, but then to really experience it is amazing because it's really true, you know. So, 
you know, where we are now, as I said, we just moved into the number one position as the largest provider of, of this type of system. Mm -hmm. And yet those major competitors are struggling to respond, not because they're, um, you know, they're not hardworking and they're not smart. It's because they're structurally in a very difficult place. So in order to really respond to us, they would have to take their best engineers, you know, we have 100 engineers, so they'd have to take their 100 best engineers off all their other products that are going to deliver next quarter's numbers, and they'd have to spend several years developing a technology, you know, that doesn't produce revenue for maybe five years, maybe four years, something like that. And then when they bring it to market, what they would do is they would go to their biggest customers and say, last year you bought something for $10 million, and I've got this new technology, this new product line, that you can have a much more reliable, much more, much easier to manage, much more cost-efficient system, and it's only going to cost you something like $2 million or $3 million. And the sales force is just not interested um, in that kind of an answer. It's just it's just very hard for them to respond, and, and you see this again and again in technology, and, and, and they're, they're, they're kind of stuck, you know. In order to really address this new market, they would have to really cannibalize their existing market, and that's really hard to do. And, you know, as a, you know, as a shareholder in one of those companies, do you really want to take that much of a hit in valuation over years mm -hmm. in order to kind of reemerge on the other side? Now, the kind of company you have built obviously has taken a lot of technology building up front to be able to get to revenue. So, yeah. you know, in the industry today, in the technology industry, it's vastly shifting to this lean startup mode where you have to, you know, bootstrap your way to success, to a validation. And then, you know, once you have customers, you have product, you have customers, you have a bit of a team, and then VCs are willing to invest. So, yeah. however, your business is not doable in a lean startup format. You've obviously done a fast, a fast startup which required venture capital up front and so forth. Can you talk to that a little bit? Because, um, you know, I, I know there are entrepreneurs out there who want to do not so lean startups. They want to build technology up front before bringing something into market. What is your advice to that category of entrepreneurs? Yeah, there, there are just certain businesses that dictate the structure. Well, actually, most businesses, um, the structure of how it should be financed is really dictated by the business, not by the entrepreneur's preference. You know, for certain businesses, let's say that the type of business is a two-sided network business where you're aggregating suppliers and customers in a certain market, you know, that is a type of business that you can grow in a lean fashion because you can just start aggregating suppliers and customers in the market. Uh, for CleverSafe, it's a different kind of business. It's a core technology business that sells to enterprises. Uh, and, you know, there, therefore the kind of expectation of version one to begin selling is extremely high. So in our case, we've had to raise, we raised, uh, we've raised over $100 million, but we had to raise um, over $50 million before we began having material customers. Um, you know, we did some pilots and some proof of concept stuff uh, to kind of verify and learn, but really we had to put $50 million in the business before it began producing revenue over a long period of time, over a five, six year period of time. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough journey for a lot of VCs, you know, to put that much money in and to go that long. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes that's just what you have to do and you have to find a way to get that kind of financing done and, and fortunately, we were able to attract invest investors that had the patience and foresight to, to join us on that journey, and we're all proud of ourselves for having done it now. But I can tell you, when we were at year five, year six, with all this invested and not really showing much revenue, it was a bit more stressful. But that's just the nature of this business and other core technology businesses that sell to enterprise, where the, the list of minimum feature set to begin selling is very long. So, um, you know, first time, you're not a first time entrepreneur. This is, this is your, what, third venture? My third big venture back startup, yeah. Third venture back startup. So, it's this kind of situation is, um, is doable for people who are on their second or third venture. It's very, right. very hard for first time entrepreneurs to get that kind of backing. I, uh, I would totally agree. It's, it's, you know, the other model that people use is they'll start some other kind of business, like a consulting business, that will generate cash 
a, a lot of cash flow and convert it over into technology business. Really hard to do. Um, so yeah, it's 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 um, in order to do this, you have to have the relationships, and you know, in order to you know reta- get that kind of I guess capital, which really means get that kind of trust for that kind of time time frame. It comes from trusted sources. So it, it, you're yeah. right. Uh, our, uh, you know, for first-time entrepreneurs who are trying to do fast startups, fast technology startups, where there is core technology development up front, bootstrapping using services is the strategy that we recommend. Um, yeah. and, and, and it is a tried and true strategy. A lot of companies have been built. It's not easy. You know, nothing is easy. Entrepreneurship is not easy, period. So this is one other difficult thing that you may have to do if that's the direction you choose to go. But yes, bootstrapping using services is something that you could look into. And this is a topic on which we have a separate book with fully fleshed out case studies and and everything. So if that's the direction that you're exploring, I recommend you check that book out and and learn the nuances and insights from those entrepreneurs who've done that. No. The, back. Other, the, other, the other model I've seen in enterprise technology businesses is if you have, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the founder, but let's say like, you know, the head of product management, the head of R&D, and, you know, like the head of sales of a enterprise storage company startup that was successful, mm-hmm. then they want to go do one of these where, you know, one of them is the, the, the CEO and, you know, it's like a founding team that, has done it before, not necessarily as the, the, the founder and CEO, but they had to play key roles. And it was a company that, you know, was a unicorn and had a billion dollar asset. That kind of a team can attract, um, you know, that, you know, the, the kind of investment. So that's yeah, domain other, another knowledge model. It's in a particular area yep. with an ex- experienced team also sometimes attract that capital. Yep. You're right. Absolutely. Now, um, Chris, you've done another thing that is unique in, um, in the industry especially the intensity and scale of it, is your IP strategy. You have, yeah. what, 185 patents or something like that? Probably well, it more depends now. Upon how you how you count. Um, if you look at, well, you know, awarded patents, um, our numbers are constantly changing. Uh, but I would say we're probably around 280 is kind of a number. Mm-hmm. And then um, applications that you can see publicly, which means we filed them at least 18 months ago, um, probably another 300, something like that, and then there's a bunch more in the queue coming. So talk about that. What's um, you know, what is the organizing principle on how you file patents, and and what kind of what what are you trying to patent at this scale? Well, I and you know, I will say one thing about that kind of a patent strategy is it's unusual, um, and we're hoping that oh, it yeah. turns out to be unusually good. Uh, you know, you don't often – I started other technology companies, and you don't usually find yourself in a domain of intellectual property that presents the opportunity to create that large of a portfolio. It's very unusual. It doesn't come around very often. And when we – you know, I normally – in my other startups, I've done like, you know, 10 to 50 patents, which is normally considered an enormous number. Um, but, you know, we're kind of more on the 500 and probably more down the road kind of number, which is a – off the charts number. We, the only other companies we've seen as new companies that have built patent portfolios at this scale, you know, one is Qualcomm, mm-hmm. and, I, and they've been extraordinarily successful yes. in, in using that to create, you know, $100 billion of, you know, market cap kind of number. And Dolby Labs also was another one uh, okay. that, you know, had about a 1,000 patent portfolios. So there's not a lot of data points. Um, our thinking was, you know, once we kind of realized that we were in the domain of just it required so much new invention and that we that we could build a portfolio like this. Our thinking was that it was it would we would get rewarded for doing it. Um, you know, some of the you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not necessarily judging the patent system, but you but you have to live with it. The reality of the of the patent system is that most patents are awarded to individuals and small businesses, but most patent royalties are, you know, go to large companies with large patent portfolios. And in our case, you know, if you look at our competitors, you know, who make uh, enterprise storage systems, you know, companies like IBM, HP, uh, EMC, and these guys have thousands of patents. And, you know, if you're going to be a leader in that market, you know, you need to match them. Uh, you need to, you know, it's a, 
it's, it's just the price of admission. So you know, if you want to be a leader in the industry, you're going to need to have a, a similar portfolio. Um, and so that was, you know, that was a lot of our thinking. And, and you know, we had the opportunity to create uh, a market-leading patent portfolio position, e even against you know these extremely large, well-established uh, incumbents that have very large positions. We thought we could match or beat them in our space. So we we decided to proceed and. Um, you know, we do feel we will be rewarded for it, but it's a very long-term uh, investment. I mean, that's a, you know, multi-decade kind of investment that we're, we're, we're really making there. No, uh, however, it is a multi-decade investment, yes, but currently, given the, the level of uh, intellectual property assets that you have created, I'm sure it impacts your valuation. Can you speak to that a bit? And, and of course, you know, part of the strategy of building a unicorn in this case is leveraging the valuation that that patent portfolio offers. What kind of premium does that get you? Well, normally, you know, what I, what I found is that if you're building a kind of a core technology creating new company, it's important to have some patents to validate that. I mean, it's hard to say, you know, we're going to create this new technology the whole industry is going to use, and we don't have any patents. But I don't think anybody would believe that it's that foundational, the technology. So normally you have, you know, some, you know, new companies will have 10 to 50 kind of patents, and that will be considered uh, a validation. And, and you know, you know that it's not so much you get a premium, it's that you need that in order to, to just be, a, you know, justified. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, it's not like with, if you have zero patents, you, you have this, and, you know, if it's 20 patents, you have that. It's like if you have zero patents, you're not going to be considered a core technology company, period. So that's, you know, that's kind of what I've seen very consistently. Um, Clevertape, however, um, doesn't fit that, mat, that mold. You know, we're more like 500 kind of patents. And, you know, we, one of our investors is the largest venture investor in the world. They have I don't know, over the many funds they've had, they've done a thousand something kind of venture investments, you know, multiple unicorns have, you know, walked through their doors. And they've never seen anything like it. So you know, venture capitalists at the end of the day are pattern matchers and they have kind of their templates and spreadsheets that say, you know, if you have X, Y, and Z, then here's your value. In our case, they didn't have a template for us. Mm -hmm. So it's it's actually hard for them to value. And so it's 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 unclear how it's affected our valuation. I think in the early days, we used it as a way to validate investment when we still weren't getting revenue. Uh, and that it really did help with that because we were able to say we are a technology leader, look at the portfolio. Uh, and now that we have customers, um, you know, we haven't done a, a financing round lately, so it's hard to say exactly how it's affected our valuation. Plus, it is so off the chart that it's also hard for a venture investor to value it. Now, if you look at, um, you know, the, the kinds of companies that we compete with, uh, if, you have, if you ever have a company, you know, like if you look at Google's acquisition of some, the Motorola asset, yeah. at that level, they know how to value thousand patent portfolios. There's no doubt about that. Um, if you look at the acquisition of Kodak or Nortel, I mean, there, there's, there's, there are templates up at that level. So if we ever get to those, you know, that kind of realm where either we're buying or, you know, um, our patent portfolio is being acquired, you know, there it can get valued. And there's really good benchmarks for that, and that's why we think we'll, we'll get rewarded, um, whether we're on the buying side or the, the uh, you know, the being acquired side of that. But kind of in the, in the you know, in your C round, D round kind of uh, venture capital, they, they don't normally see portfolios like this, so it's hard for them to map, have match, and therefore it's, it's unclear how it affects the value. Well, you know, I, just kind of doing some thumb rule, I'm, I was thinking about this in my head, how I would do it, and, and you know, let's say your, uh, your revenue-based valuation and market size and, and growth-based valuation is a, a, about half a billion to, you know, 750 million kind of level. You're clearly going to get quarter billion to another half a billion in revenue, multiple, uh, you know, upside, sorry, valuation upside, because of the patent portfolio is it was what I was calculating and, and that gets you to you know over a billion dollar valuation. Well we'll see. Like I said, we haven't done financing in a while and you know the rubber meets the road when it happens. So I, I don't know. 
you decide to go public, you'll have to make a, some sort of a case for, for how this gets, you know, presented to the investors. All right, yeah, so sure. um, uh, switching topics, we talked a little bit about this innovator's dilemma presenting opportunities for, you know, startups to come into the market in very, very promising um, new, op new market segments. Is there anything on your radar right now where a, a market segment is going through that kind of change and the incumbents are in this innovator's dilemma situation? Well, certainly that's happening in our market. Um, you know, I, I'm so focused on enterprise storage that I don't really study other markets. Um, you know, I, the, the other two adjacent markets we see is, uh, you know, there's three segments to enterprise storage. There's the one we're in, which is the big enterprise storage system, um, which IDC calls capacity optimized. There's the flash um, segment, um, which IDC calls IO optimized. And, you know, that's a segment that's going through the same disruption, but it's interesting to see how different the market is reacting, you know, because they're both, you look at capacity optimized storage, which is our world, um, it's, it's, it's enormous, it's, it's, you know, the, the demand is growing, it's going through a dis, uh, disruption, you know, we're seeing a classic innovator dilemma like we were talking about. But if you look at Flash, the technology is enabling a similar sort of disruption. Um, but what's different there is the venture community realized that early on and and really got behind it, and maybe you could argue that they, they overfunded it and that there are, you know, 10 to 20 multi-hundred million dollar venture-backed companies that have gone at that space. It's about a $4 billion market. And, um, you know, so yes, yeah, going through disruption, but there there are so many players, so many disruptors, that it's it's, it's very it's a very different dynamic, and so the incumbents have been able to buy some, um, you know, without having to pay a, a huge premium because there's a lot to choose from, and yet and it's very competitive because you know the incumbents who are now getting in the market because they've done some acquisition, and then there's the there's still a number of venture back companies. It's it's very different. So I guess in each case, you know, there is an innovator's dilemma, but I guess the the rules kind of change when there's 10 to 20 disruptors, and now all of a sudden disruption isn't, isn't unique. Um, so those are the, you know, the markets that I know well, and I, you know, I don't really have the time to kind of look at other ones to see how disruptive technology change is affecting them. So last question. You've done all this from Chicago. Yeah. What in your experience, pros, cons, thoughts? Well, you know, the biggest advantage we have, and I was actually just working on this for an internal presentation I have to make, is Chicago uh, produces as many engineers as San Francisco. The universities in Chicago produce as many as in San Francisco. And the difference is, you know, in San Francisco, there's a hundred plus, you know, technology, core technology companies and a hundred biomedical companies and all this demand for that talent. And, you know, one of the challenges you have out there is you, know, you have to pay a huge uh, salary, uh, you know, a lot of compensation, and yet even at a fairly high level, it's a difficult life for an engineer um, to get ahead because it's kind of expensive. It is really expensive. And then you have, as a, as a company, it's hard to retain people for, you know, long periods of time. In our case, you know, we have um, – a lot of interest in, in engineers that want to work for us, and we're able to pick extremely high-quality people. I was looking at a picture of the company in 2008 of all the employees winning a, an innovation award. And at the time, we had 41 employees, and 24 of them are still here seven years later. So the average employee from then has more than seven years of tenure, and a lot of people are at eight or nine years. I don't think that normally happens in Silicon Valley, and that's a huge advantage to us. I mean, we have hundreds of person years of experience at this company working on these problems. Very that's unusual. an enormous advantage for us. And and we pay less than people would make in Silicon Valley, but at the same time, people here have a house that's twice as big. And, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a much, it's a much better lifestyle in that sense. Yeah. You know, uh, we had 
As part of our Entrepreneur Journey series, we had Greg uh, Gianforte from right now, who has yeah. done exactly your strategy in Montana, in Bozeman, Montana, which yeah. is amazing. And of course, right now it was acquired by Oracle eventually. So now yeah. Oracle has this huge uh, right now operation in Bozeman, Montana, but it was exactly the argument that you're making is that it's these great quality of life, easy to retain, and, and they were even able to move people from Silicon Valley to Montana because of that quality yeah. of life um, value. Well, we are at the end of the time that you uh, gave us, so thank you, Chris, for coming, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's fascinating what you've done, and uh, we will follow your journey. Thank you right, for sharing. Thanks, it was a real pleasure to talk to you. I enjoyed it. Folks, we're going to move to the mentoring portion of the session today. Um, Bob Bear is the first entrepreneur. Bob, if you could unmute your line, that would be fantastic. Hi, Sermana. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Great. Okay, um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, um, I spent about 20 years um, in uh, web development. I had a passion for that early on um, in my life, and it was only in the last two years that I've actually um, had an interest awaken in opportunities uh, in technology and online business as far as being an entrepreneur goes. Um, it was about five years ago that I started my entrepreneurial journey running a local uh, service-based business. Um, next slide, please. And Bob, so where are you where, currently? Um, I'm located in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Okay, super. So we're just 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 north of you. And uh, so the business we're establishing is currently focused on helping operators of entertainment companies uh, to improve or solve some of the challenges running their live show uh, using software. Um, so hence, we've got a minimum viable product which provides uh, easy online management of song inventory, and this is designed for uh, DJs and karaoke um, entertainers at live venues. Um, so they have features such as browsing um, song requests uh, and submitting song requests that they open up to their guests at these live venues, um, enhancing the interactive aspect of the experience um, as well as minimizing the uh, logistics of uh, paper-based uh, management systems, which we'll talk a little more about. Um, but as I mentioned, it's an MVP, so we're hoping it will go on to encompass a suite of tools that will uh, provide value to uh, businesses in this uh, industry, um, helping them stay in front of their venue guests and, and customers and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So our ideal customer profile consists of DJs, karaoke, jockeys currently using that system. Um, you know, which we feel is uh, antiquated by today's standards. Um, and uh, they'd be willing to invest uh, in their business and, and leverage the upside benefits of what uh, this type of platform would provide them. Um, they'd be interested in wanting to adopt a user-friendly system that worked, uh, um, minimized uh, the pains for them um, in that respect, as well as um, offer uh, that to their customers in an elegant fashion. And they would also recognize value of providing the best uh, service experience possible for their for their guests. Uh, next slide, please. Go ahead. Okay, um, so um, we've got uh, customer acquisition strategies of uh, basically outbound uh, email list the development, uh, marketing to those lists, um, Thinking of Google AdWords, uh, Facebook advertising, uh, cold calling to identify with uh, customers that, uh, to pr promote awareness and see if that this is a fit uh, for their business and any press you know, not we can receive. Currently, um, no, we are pre-revenue. Uh, we do have some uh, some demos uh, out uh, that people are using, and we're getting a positive positive response on that. So that's uh, covered in a in an upcoming slide. So if you just pop back one, um, uh, we've got, we'll do some market response, inbound follow-up, we want to promote with free trials, uh, that type of thing, and then we'd like to convert those customers and new signups into um, uh, paid accounts, of course. So next slide. So market validation, um, we are looking at, uh, well, these are some of our numbers. Um, they're definitely small, but we'd like to actually see what the market is capable of, so hopefully our estimates are simply just conservative and 
uh, realistic for initial the initial growth phase that we're clearly um, in right now is we're bootstrapping. So uh, we're, our goal is eight weeks, so we'd have uh, at least 10 paid accounts producing somewhere in the ballpark of a couple hundred dollars a month, a few hundred dollars. In six months, we'd like to have uh, significantly more generating more revenue, maybe in around uh, 12 to 1500. Uh, and then uh, in a couple of years, we'd be making maybe uh, five digits or something per month. So we, there's a couple uh, people in the industry doing similar things. One venture is holding member subscriptions for a similar product in 40 different countries. They're charging about 200 per year. And another company also has a system that they um, have on many websites and it's about $100 a year, but they've got quite a big user base. So we see that there's some potential here for sure. Next so, slide, um, please. Actually, let me understand mm -hmm. one simple thing that is bugging me as I'm listening to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Why wouldn't DJs use an iTunes playlist, for instance? Um, basically, what will happen at these venues is that people will want to know what songs are available to them so that they can request in. So um, they're specifically interested in the selections that that particular operator or DJ has available. So what we're doing is providing an elegant solution for them, an interactive solution for them to be able to browse those selections, submit them, you know, share their experience and, and uh, um, you know, uh, basically get more from the, um, the uh, DJ basically. iTunes, um, I guess is just, well, obviously just an online payment. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different format. But it's, I mean, online payment, most DJs have bought a lot of these songs, so they're sitting in their uh, iCloud or in their um, mm -hmm. laptop. Yeah, the, yeah, the difference is is that, that our system would provide uh, their guests with access to this content. Um, their browsing their content selection would give them an in to um, some of their, uh, the, kind of the longer term vision here is be able to market to these ones that use this platform at their venues. So now they can stay in front of um, their guests, you know, um, using, uh, you know, this platform that could provide marketing advantages, branding advantages, um, that type of thing, uh, when they're um, not at venues as well, so they can stay top of mind. And, and we really feel that this industry of, you know, mobile DJ and stuff like that is, it, from a technology standpoint, it, it's, it's very underdeveloped, and um, we feel that, um, you know, uh, like everything's going with the marketing these days, that um, that there's an opportunity there to um, um, elevate the standard for that. And the numbers that you quoted about your a couple of other competitors who are charging two hundred dollars a year and hundred dollars a year, how do you mm -hmm. how do you command premium pricing given that that is what the market currently is is tolerating? Yeah, it, it, one aspect of what they're currently offering um, is is not really the solutions that they have available are not very um, elegant or inviting to use. Uh, they're very kind of again they look antiquated and they're charging um, kind of very baseline pricing. Um, it, at, at the same token, it's not an industry that boasts you know uh, seven figures or anything of that sort as well. So um, we don't see it as being a, you know like a you know, a unicorn company, obviously, but um, but uh, want to uh, make an impact in that industry and uh, and position ourselves a little bit above uh, uh, the the other players that we know are out there. Okay, so you're uh, we'll, you'll know very soon within the next eight min weeks, next six months, how the industry is responding to your pricing and to your offering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so yeah, so uh, for validation and and to accelerate. Um, you know, we, we've obviously uh, had some uh, uh, trials uh, issued to people. The response on those has been very positive. Um, and uh, we're getting a lot of email opt-ins from our website, so we'll be marketing to that list as well. A um, couple things we haven't done yet is uh, automate the sign-up process on our on our website, provide feedback forms and such to, uh, to further assess, uh, you know, the needs of the market. And then as well, you know, just being bootstrap mode, we uh, – uh, don't have a lot of capital, so growth is a little bit um, uh, hindered. Um, so, but uh, yeah, that's our that's our concept, and uh, and uh, we're we're happy for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, about that uh, before the one M by one M today. All right. Do you have any questions or 
that's pretty much what um, you Yeah, pretty much what I wanted to say, I guess, um, I think, and maybe confirm if I'm wrong, the next step would be just to basically validate that uh, concept and uh, do so with, uh, you know, if we can meet some of our objectives here that, that we know we'd be able to have something that we could perhaps scale down the road. If, if you see that as being a, a next step for us. Uh, okay, validation is, is the primary thing that you need to achieve. And, and here, in this case, if you can get your customers to start paying, then, you know, very quickly you would be able to start, you know, generating revenue and covering your costs. What, what is the timeline that you, given your current cost structure and the cost, cost structure that you anticipate to cover, uh, you know, this period of, let's say, eight weeks, six months, two and a half years that you have laid out here, uh, at what point are you breaking even? I think that if we hit the six month figure, we would recoup or our uh, goal for six months that we'd be able to recuperate um, our initial um, investment in, in bootstrapping. So, somewhere what about an on ongoing there. burn rate basis? On an ongoing what? Ongoing burn rate basis, your ongoing monthly expenses. What? Where do you start covering those? Um, we're pretty lean, so um, you know it's we're running out of uh, an, an apartment. Uh, our overhead is quite low. Um, uh, just sustaining innovation, obviously, in development and adding more value to this sector um, will come with a cost. So I think if we can get somewhere around, um, you know, 100 100 paid plans, um, that we would we would have some momentum at that point. All right. Well, good luck. You know what to do. You need to go find yeah. customers. <laughs> Thanks, Sermana. You're welcome. Sunil <laughs> Madhatil, you're up next. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Ramana, and uh, you know, this is Sunil here. Uh, you're able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, basically uh, the, the concept here which I wanted to share uh, is uh, uh, the, the big uh, uh, industry segment uh, lookout today is for the right skills which we require uh, for various industry segments, not only the IT, uh, uh, the non-IT segment as well. So that is where the, I find a great opportunity in terms of streamlining that and then bringing in the right skills to meet the, um, uh, you know, corporates or the enterprise. Uh, so that is the topic which uh, I would uh, like to discuss uh, today. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? A little bit about, about uh, myself. Uh, uh, I have an industry experience of close to about uh, 19 uh, plus years, uh, started as uh, purely a sales person. So uh, I uh, am not an IT graduate or an engineer by profession, but uh, have gained all my experience uh, being in the IT industry, uh, selling uh, uh, IT equipments uh, uh, and uh, uh, softwares. Uh, moved into uh, a large IT organization and currently work there. Uh, and uh, I have been moving more closely into the operations role. And uh, today I handle talent management for a unit which has close to about 5,000 plus resources. Okay. Uh, where uh, my uh, uh, role is more in terms of, you know, uh, getting the right skills from the external market uh, and move into the business uh, to meet those requirements. Also, uh, a look at uh, uh, moving the internal pool of available resources and skills uh, to meet the business requirements. Uh, also, uh, uh, have the uh, existing uh, skills uh, uh, to be cross-skilled uh, into the uh, niche uh, uh, skills, you know. So, uh, that is where, you know, my role is currently looking at. And, uh, you know, I have been uh, always lo looking at challenging roles. So, that is where I moved in from a six person to uh, more in terms of, you know, handling talent management. So, uh, just on the topic of the uh, skills availability, uh, if you look at uh, uh, India, uh, the, the population is close to about 1.3 billion, 
uh, where we have you know 0.8 million uh, uh, billion uh, in the working age uh, and you know if you really look at uh, by 2020 uh, this is something going to be very alarming and if you look at the current fitment of uh, skills uh, it, it's 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 pretty uh, you know, 70 to 75, per, uh, 80 percent across industry segment have a great concern, uh, and uh, the the skills which come out of the uh, uh, university or the uh, graduated uh, skill uh, get into roles which may not be uh, the role which is actually they look at, uh, or uh, they just get into something uh, because uh, it's just available. Uh, that is where there is a lot of mismatch. Enterprises also uh, uh, look at, uh, uh, you know, onboarding uh, the, the resources through the campus recruitments uh, and which uh, they, they go in and, you know, take the bunch of uh, uh, students who are available in their final semester and then uh, uh, train them once they finish their examinations and they you know get onto their certifications and finally they get into a uh, training within the enterprise and then start being deployed. But practically, uh, if you really see after all this training, still these are considered as trainees uh, where they, they are pretty uh, not deployable immediately. And that is where there is a huge gap between the source, which is the university or the uh, colleges, and the destination, which is nothing but the enterprises. So this is where, you know, we look at tapping the uh, uh, students who are doing their final semesters and they need the projects to be, to be a compliance when they finish their final semester. So that is where, you know, we look at uh, uh, tapping that resource and this is where the entire business model uh, evolves. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So what is that which we are uh, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, is mapping the students to the corporate requirement very early, uh, provide the skills enhancements to meet the corporate requirement for employment. So when we look at uh, uh, a student who finishes a particular project, that particular project, either it is linked to a billable uh, project for the enterprise, and that is where the skill is identified as a map, a match to that enterprise, and then uh, uh, becomes employable. Uh, and the whole idea is catch the uh, uh, young talent and prepare the uh, prepare them for the niche requirements. So that is uh, one side. Uh, from the uh, uh, you know requirement and the when we look at the value proposition we have for the business uh, or the enterprise you have skills who are young energetic and grooming to become uh, young managers so, so you have right from uh, the doers to the uh, management uh, level which can be uh, moved in you know for the educational institution it is mainly placement of the students through the uh, projects what they are uh, to do and more practical in terms of, you know, becoming employable uh, uh, students. And for the students, it is right about employability because just after when they get into, get out of the campus, they get employment and uh, they, they work on uh, real-time projects. Uh, and, uh, you know, also uh, they, they can be looked at, you know, moving from whatever is the deficient skill that can be groomed and you know uh, made into a, a more deployable uh, skill. So in a nutshell, this is uh, nothing but meeting the education institution and the enterprise through the student requirement. So uh, in terms of the execution strategy, uh, uh, you know the first phase is uh, you know the institutions uh, which involve the uh, engineering and management uh, uh, colleges and you know uh, uh, institutions to be signed up. Uh, then we uh, have the uh, identification of the final semester students. Then we, we need to identify the projects which needs to be worked out with the corporates. Uh, and then that is where the value add of the uh, skills to the project is uh, uh, done. 
uh, and uh, finally we identify the performing students uh, to meet those project requirements and absorption of the students to the uh, uh, corporate post the uh, due diligence into that project. And after the first phase, this, this we would focus more in terms of the engineering and management uh, uh, students. Uh, the second phase we can spread it over to the organized retail because uh, retail is something which is also growing. Uh, and with all the FDI and all these things which is happening in India, the resources are also much more required uh, here. And the uh, other area which we can look at is soft skill training and readiness to corporate culture because uh, the young crowd when it just comes out of the college, uh, they, they, they are pretty raw, they could have to be, uh, uh, you know, moved up with respect to the business communication, etiquette and all these things which we can uh, look at in this. So, so this is a typical executive execution strategy which we can uh, look at and that, that is what I would like to share uh, and, you know, we could get into a discussion now. So my first reaction is the business plan keeps showing up at these roundtables every few months. Um, you know, okay. there are numerous un, uh, entrepreneurs in India who are trying to do this employability uh, value proposition, uh, and we've seen numerous such value propositions. So I would like to understand what is your, uh, you know, uh, you should understand what is your competitive landscape and who's doing what and, and who's gaining traction and why. And, and we've been, by the way, we've been seeing these business plans for many years now. So uh, you're not the first person thinking about this. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what you're asking here. I'm, I don't understand your question. Do you want to explain what yeah. you Okay. So uh, one is, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, there are, this idea has uh, come up even uh, prior and, you know, this has been showcased. Uh, uh, and you also mentioned that, you know, uh, you need to understand the, the competitive landscape. But uh, w w would this idea uh, uh, earlier have been, you know, very successfully taken up and marketed and, you know, gone into a, a scene that uh, daylight or I, I have no idea. I don't have. I don't follow people who come and pitch here throughout their cycle. That's not our policy. You have to do your own competitive okay. analysis. I can't do that for you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so with this uh, uh, pitch, uh, uh, what could be your uh, uh, thought uh, in terms of uh, you know? Uh, 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 what, what is that which you feel that, you know, we need to uh, do here, I need to do here? First thing you should do is to go do the comparative analysis to see where is the gap and, and okay. figure out, you know, what, perhaps what industry segments are being catered to, what ex industry segments are not being catered to. IT is very over catered to in, in the market, so you want to find a gap. You need to find a positioning for your company. Okay. That's okay. primary feedback. I'd like to understand where, you know, if I were to get into this market, I would like to understand where, you know, at this stage of the game, given that there is all this other entrepreneurial activity, where is a gap in the market? Okay. Okay. Okay, fine. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good point. I, I would ponder on that. Thanks for this. You're welcome. All right, folks, uh, if you like what we're doing here, our request to you is to refer serious entrepreneurs to 1M1M. And the word serious is very important because it takes many years of commitment and really hard work to build a company. And uh, we are not looking for fly-by-night entrepreneurs who think they're going to make money overnight. That's not entrepreneurship. We are really looking for those kinds of entrepreneurs who understand that this is a marathon, not a sprint, and want to run that marathon. And in that case, we will put all our resources behind that person to help you know, make him or her successful. So let me run you through uh, what you can expect from 1M1M in terms of resources and contribution in your journey. Everything, by the way, is at 1MBY1M.com, so you will find tons of material over there. I'll just walk you through the logic of the program. Um, you'll find a free blog on the website, which is chock full of learning material. 
So it's very inspirational, very educative material that we strongly recommend that you start following on a regular basis if you aren't doing already. We also have the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, which of which we have published 12 volumes so far, and each of them double click down on a specific topic. So we just talked about positioning. We do have a book on positioning, and of course we have a very comprehensive curriculum module on positioning. It's one of the core elements of the entrepreneur's journey is to find what market to go after and, and where in that market are you going to position your business. Um, so look through the Entrepreneur Journey series. Everything is on Kindle um, and available globally. So it should be easy to pick where in that series do you want to start your exploration if that's the um, direction you want to take. Also, we have tons of material on the website. The, the website is an incredibly rich website and you will find huge amounts of material on a variety of different topics. These roundtables happen every week. So every Thursday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific time, um, you are welcome to come to these roundtables. You can pitch, you can get feedback, um, and, and they've been around. We've done these over and over again, and, and uh, we've added a lot of value to our entrepreneurs. If you decide that you want to pitch or attend, you would need to go to the free public roundtable page on the website and register. Um, easy to do, very, very easy uh, little experience. You can do it from home or from off from your office, and uh, and we'll love to have you in subsequent sessions. In addition, we have the 1M1M Premium Program, which is a $1,000 annual membership fee, and you get extensive methodology guidance to put exactly how you can put one foot before the other in your entrepreneurial journey. We have a very strong curriculum. We help you with business development. We help you with a pretty intensive level of strategy consulting. We have private roundtables, members-only versions similar to these, but we have much more details, the in-depth discussions there. And if you get to a point where you are financeable, and we will help you if your business has the dynamics of fundability, we will help you get there, and we will also help you with the financing through introductions into our network and so forth. Media relations is something that we do as well. We have a lot of clout in the media, and we try to help you get coverage and visibility so that your product or service is known out there. And that's a very important piece of the entrepreneurship puzzle is to get your product or service out there uh, visible to people who would buy those that product or service. The Million Dollar Club is a link on the website. You can look at some of our case studies of success stories. We also have an ROI analysis. We provide 375,000 plus five to 10% equity worth of value for just $1,000 annual membership fee. So we do not charge any equity. It is an incredibly high value program at an incredibly affordable price. And we give you lots of orientation material on how to use the program effectively. Having said that, one million by one million is like a gym. So once you subscribe to a gym, you have to still go do the workout. Other, without doing the workout, you cannot get, get in shape. It's the same philosophy here at 1M1M. You have to do the work. You have to do the heavy lifting. And if you do that, we will be with you shoulder to shoulder and uh, help you become successful. But just by joining the program, you will not be successful if you're not also doing the workouts. The self-assessment is something that I strongly recommend all of you to look at. It's, these are the questions that you should be asking yourself as you develop your business. These are the areas where you, most entrepreneurs need the most work. So it's a nine-point questionnaire that will help you calibrate your business. We have tons of evaluation material about the premium program on the website, what to expect from the program, video FAQs, etc. Whatever questions you have, uh, you will find answers there. The curriculum is a combination of case studies of several hundred successful entrepreneurs, over 600 of them, and video lectures. So you are looking at um, learning from over 600 successful entrepreneurs in a very compact, efficient way through this program. Nothing like this exists anywhere. You will learn seven core topics, and there are numerous subtopics in each of them, bootstrapping, positioning, 
market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. And then the electives are Web 3.0 and e-commerce, cloud computing and business solutions, mobile and social apps, healthcare, IT, online education, gaming. We have a, a set of new unicorns, fem, uh, women uh, entrepreneurship, you know, women entrepreneurs, what issues they're facing. We also have one uh, new uh, elective on unicorns, you know, how to build unicorns. And we have numerous, we have like over 35 unicorn case studies that we have built that, uh, that module around. So um, very powerful, um, you know, very, very powerful content that we have leveraged to give you insights in a very compact, very efficient way that you can digest that information. Our methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups most of, mostly. And the reason being, today's market requires, investors require, even if you go fund your company later on, Investors require validated businesses to fund, especially if you're a first-time entrepreneur. If you're a serial entrepreneur and you have track record, that's a whole different ball game. But our audience primarily is first-time entrepreneurs, and, and there you do not have a choice but to follow a you know, lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startup methodology such that you can validate your business before investors are willing to come in. That's just something we hear from over and over and over again from both entrepreneurs who have raised money as well as investors who are investing in entrepreneurs, and that's just something that you have to accept as the reality of the game. Um, if you go to the press page, you will see a lot of coverage of our premium members, get a feel for what kind of coverage we generate. We also give you access to our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. We have huge social media presence, and we will let you Use that to get your messages out there on our blog as well. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I want to mention is that if you're working on a community that you're trying to develop entrepreneurship in, you're welcome to become an affiliate partner of the 1M1M program. We have an affiliate program. Upcoming roundtables, February 12th, 19th, and 26th. The rest of the month, we are here every week. Uh, Vision India 2020 is a 13th book from the 1M1M portfolio. It is an ideation book. If you are still looking for an idea and if you're working on an emerging market, this book will help you ideate. And uh, it's written as a business fiction book set in 2020 looking back on solving big problems. So, you know, it uses a technique called visioning. It's a very fun read, actually. Um, and then we have this 1M1M incubator in a box, which other partners can use. We primarily use this with our corporate partners but other players can use it as well to set up their own incubation um, infrastructure in these, uh, using the 1M1M incubator in a box. So once again, the Billion Dollar Unicorns Entrepreneur Journeys book is out. Please check it out. It's a powerful uh, little volume that you will learn a lot from in, you know, kind of having coffee with 17 unicorn entrepreneurs, not something you get to do very often. Uh, in the Alpha Journey series, other recent books are Carnival in the Cloud, focused on cloud computing, bootstrapping with a paycheck, another very uh, popular tried and true approach to bootstrapping a startup, getting a business off the ground, and also e-commerce to Web 3.0 is our coverage on the e-commerce sector. Again, very powerful, punchy volume focused on that segment and where I believe that segment is going. That's pretty much it. We are ready for Q&A. So anybody who wants to call in or ask questions is very welcome to do so. You can also ask questions in public chat, and I will pick up questions from the chat right now. You can also let us know if you're calling in. So let me see. We have a question from Bob Baer. Uh, Hi, Shramana. I'm interested to know about the history of 1M1M as a business. Did it ever go through a bootstrapping phase? Perhaps this was covered on a previous roundtable or blog post. 1M1M is completely bootstrapped. 1M1M is a bootstrapped business, bootstrapped profitable business. That's how we operate. We've never raised any money. We were offered money right from the beginning, but we have never raised any money. Does that answer your question? Prasad, in the 1M1M premium program, what is the pre minimum number of hours we need to allocate for taking efficient use of the program? I understand the more we prepare the practice, 
and practice the best it, better it is, but since I also have to spend time with my, absolutely. Very good question, Prasad. Our recommendation is you budget about 50 hours to do the core curriculum, and then, you know, up to you another 50 hours for, um, for the electives, and then we recommend that you attend the weekly private roundtables. So, uh, you know, you can spread it over time. You don't, you don't need to uh, spend 50 hours in a week. You can spread it over several months. So it really is up to you. And we have obviously, just by the nature of the program, we have tons of entrepreneurs who are practicing entrepreneurs. So they, they can only commit so much time to, to do what they need to do. But if you, you know, if you pace yourself and if you, you know, give it adequate time, without disrupting the rest of the workflow of your business, you can plenty comfortably make a lot of progress. We have lots of evidence of people getting very far with the program following its methodology. You're welcome. Anybody else? Feel free to, by the way, introduce yourselves as well. This is a very good, um, uh, time also to network. You can tell us where you're joining from, what you're working on, how you got here, and so forth. Bob Bear is asking, is there any published material on effective sales pipeline development in 1M1M? Yes, we have a whole sales 2.0 module. That is one of our most popular modules. It is premium content. You have to be a member to access that, yes. But we do have a, a very powerful uh, sales pipeline development module. You know, Prasad, the, the biggest help you're going to get in helping, in, in measuring and guiding your progress is, you know, you will move from, I don't know what stage you're in, but we move people from validation stage to revenue stage to scaling revenue stage to, you know, we scale you through the process of your business metrics. So it's not so much, you know, random nebulous measuring. You are going to have real business metrics that you're going to move through. And we will put that together as we start working together. You will put those, you know, based on where you are and what makes sense as your next milestone, next step, what you're going after, what you're trying to accomplish. We will define that together as we go through the, as you come into the program and, and start building your business through the program. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? Now let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you need, if you have questions about the program, you can call her. Her phone number is 786-301-2456. She requests that you email her, irina at 1mby1m.com, and um, she can also give you, if, if you decide to set up a time to Skype with her, she can also set up a Skype time with her or a phone time, whatever. But just get in touch with her by email and, and she will be happy to help you and, and get on the phone with you, whatever you need, in addition to what you've heard here. The news says the initial sign up would help move from idea to revenue is my, whatever stage you are at, we have people coming in at idea stage, pre-idea stage, revenue stage, pre-revenue stage, revenue stage that is trying to scale to the next level, Funding, looking for funding, we have all stages. So whatever stage you come in at, we will basically help you move to whatever is the next logical step that you need to get to. Prasad says, I'm a first time entrepreneur, so I thank you for this, it's valuable, and can we join the program anytime, or is there any scheduled classes start date? No scheduled classes start date, you can join anytime you want to. So the asynchronous material, the curriculum, is at your own pace. You start and you step through the curriculum at your own pace. Roundtables happen every week, and you can come and ask for help on the roundtable at whatever stage you want to be. And all these, by the way, all these questions that you're asking, we have thought it through and, and built it into the design of the program deliberately because we want people, we want practicing entrepreneurs, we want idea stage entrepreneurs, and we want you know, multi-stage entrepreneurs to be able to, multi-stage but early stage entrepreneurs to be able to use the program in as flexible a mode as possible. 
So we don't lock you into a class schedule or you have to start in January, you have to start in April. We don't have any of that requirement. It's completely flexible. And you can do it nights, you can do it weekends, whatever suits you. It's all built into the design of flexibility and scalability. Anybody else? Questions, comments, introductions? No? All right, well, if there are no questions or comments further, we hope to see you back here next week. And as you can see, we are bringing in very, very exciting guests each time, and you learn something from each of these people. So I encourage you to continue um, you know, participating in these roundtables, and if you miss the live session, listen to it in recording, share the recordings with your friends and colleagues and, and fellow entrepreneurs so that everybody can learn from the resource that we have put together here. Thank you everyone for attending, and uh, we will meet you back here next week. Same time, same place. Bye, everybody.